about it. Just first a little bit about Startup Grind. We are a global startup community. We are in uh, more than 100 cities and 42 countries. Uh, and basically we are in place to educate, inspire, and to connect entrepreneurs. And the way that we do that is by bringing together startup founders, uh, educators, um, invest uh, investors, angel investors, all around the topic of entrepreneurship. So uh, when I started in December, um, brought sort of grind uh, to the area, we were only, just to give you an idea of the scale that we are moving at, we were only in 50 <coughs> cities and we were in about 35 countries. So just since January, um, we have just grown, uh, grown in a global way. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, I got involved in startup grind because um, I was doing some business coaching. Uh, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I've always wanted to have my own business. I'm um, doing some business coaching, came across the website, really love their values uh, and what they stand for, which is kind of giving and not taking, kind of counterintuitive to a lot of the things that we say. It's about making relationships and, and not just making contacts. Uh, and so I thought, this is really cool. Um, we are a little bit different from some of the other entrepreneur events that you'll see because it's about the story. So what we are doing is we are um, inviting our speakers to come and share, not just about their successes, because if they're up on the stage, then we figure that they've achieved a fair amount of success. But we really want to know, what are the obstacles that you've overcome? What are the things that are going to get me from the audience <coughs> on the stage? So I'm excited tonight that we have got someone from Spotify. We've got Max Weber. Um, he is head of their uh, global CRM operations. Um, and uh, we are going to be talking, um, have, a, have a kind of an interesting conversation about how to operationalize your business, um, helping your business run uh, leaner, uh, as I like to say, better, faster, stronger. Um, so I just want you, we have a tradition in Startup Grind, uh, and so that we um, love to make our speakers feel loved and great. So I would like to ask everyone to rest on your feet and help me to welcome Max Weber from Spotify. <laughs> Excited. Um, just real, real excited to have you here. We already had a, uh, an extensive <laughs> conversation um, the other day, uh, just kind of catching up. Um, uh, so, gonna kind of talk a little bit about just a little bit about Spotify, um, a little bit about you, um, and um, the interesting topic. The topic that uh, sticks with me is how to make things better, faster, stronger. Because of, as we both know, and we're gonna by the end of this evening, everyone in this room is gonna know that. Um, it doesn't matter what size your business is, it doesn't matter what your industry is, but that you are able to use um, the techniques that you're going to talk about and just really, not just help your business run better, faster, stronger, but just in general. So um, chat, I'm sure that most people in this room know what Spotify is, but just briefly uh, kind of talk about Spotify. Yep, we're a music streaming service, uh, similar to kind of a Pandora we hate to use, use that Andorra. word, just, you know, yeah, it's I don't a know. sacrilegious, yeah. but uh, yeah, we've got about 40 plus million subscribers at this point. Um, not only do we have the radio service, but uh, you can directly choose your music. We're incorporating some other stuff that I can't really talk about. It's sure. coming, but sure. uh, yeah, in general, it's, it's a music company. And so it's a, it's a music company, uh, but not just a music company, because um, it's a company that started abroad. Uh, and has, uh, you know, massively ramped up uh, abroad, and then come over here to the states. Uh, I know that there is a big um, footprint in New York City uh, headquarters, yep. and you're off. You're actually here in Saratoga now. So um, uh, Spotify has a local footprint, uh, and how did that come about? And, and what are you guys doing up there in Saratoga? Uh, well, the the headquarters out of Stockholm, Sweden. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the companies there. Uh, we have the second. Big offices in Manhattan, uh, which is probably 200, 250 people there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Saratoga office came through an acquisition of a company called Tunago. And what they do is music curation. So all the browse section that you see on Spotify is all the playlists. That's that team from Saratoga. Okay. Um, and that's where I'm out of there about two days a week, two days down the city. So you get a, get a nice get a uh, mix between the two because you were, you were in the city mm -hmm. uh, for, for, eight, for some time. Eight or nine years. Okay. So you actually have a, a really interesting um, uh, journey that you've taken to get you to where you are. And so um, just wanted to chat a little bit about that. Um, I'll start with stockbroker on Wall Street. And so uh, people sometimes say to me, how did you get from um, 
I recently left the legislature, the New York State legislature. How do you, how do you go from the legislature to <laughs> to start up grind? Mm -hmm. And actually, the, you know, when you when you open it up a little bit, it may, I mean, I did broadcast for six years, you know, at the legislature, so it wasn't that far of a jump. But you had a you had a really interesting path. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, I started out as, as a Series 63 to Series 7 stockbroker, um, and we used at the time Salesforce for our uh, CRM platform, and I ended up becoming the de facto uh, wizard for that tool at the firm. And I spent more time kind of figuring out business process automation, how to speed things up. Mm -hmm. um, I spent more time kind of building out that system than I did selling. So right. I kept right. bombing out my numbers. <laughs> and I decided I liked uh, the tech side more and the more of the operations and the system automation stuff. So uh, from there, I quit and took a job at a startup, uh, which did consulting for CRM and Salesforce. Okay, so uh, not 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 that not that far of a of a stretch as, as one might think from when I first I was like stock, like stockbroker seriously stockbroker into um, so you what uh, what we talked about um, and that was very appealing to me when we we had our, our first conversation um, I am all about the concept of better faster stronger that is my you know before I leave the station I'll share a little bit about the business that I just launched but that is that is my thing it's better faster stronger. And that takes place anywhere. And that was a connect that we made when I realized um, when you began to explain what you did and how you did it. And it, and it really, you, you worked with Salesforce for quite a while. Um, it, briefly, just, um, just in case folks don't know, talk just a teeny bit about what CRM is. Uh, well, I mean, CRM is kind of the operational platform that stores the majority of operational business data. So in any business, you're generally either selling something or you're a service. Right. So... Um, it's in either case you're going to require some place to store client information sure. um, and keep a database of your business. Okay. Uh, and what a CRM tool allows you to do is take the data and then take action against it. Right. So you know if I want to set up a, a drip email campaign where somebody signs up, signs up for my website, you know I want it to automatically create a record in my system one day later, send them a pre-canned email. And then two days later, follow up with a phone call. Sure. I don't want to have to remember to do that every time. Right. I have a system that I can set to do that for me. Right. So, so. it's customer relationship management. And I know that because I looked it up because I wasn't really sure. It's a, it's a term that you hear, you know, often. Um, but you actually have uh, been able to kind of weave that. Um, you make Salesforce do things that, you know, maybe, maybe Salesforce's designers didn't realize that it would do. And, again, that comes back to... And we'll talk more about that later. The better, faster, stronger. Um, so, you, like you said, when you were a stockbroker, you found yourself so massaging your data management, uh, the data that you had, and created such a beautiful system. And that's where um, uh, the love came. And so, as you um, found yourself moving, did you find yourself moving into companies? And we're going someplace with this, folks. This isn't just a, the bio of Max, but this is all going to come back around about how operationalizing and managing your data, how, why that's so important. But as you were moving through the different companies that you were in, um, did you find yourself uh, gravitating towards, I mean, did you just jump into CRM or did you find yourself doing CRM-ish things in the companies that you were with? I think kind of both. Uh, I always liked sales and the sales process. I just always hated the, the quota and the concept of sure. that hanging over my head. So sure. I wanted to be a part of the sales process uh, and the money machine, but not necessarily <coughs> the front lines. So. I've always been a real analytical problem solver. Right. I like to, what I say is cut clicks. Right. So if it takes 10 clicks to do something, I want it to take five. Right. Right. So that's, a full five? Yeah. <laughs> maybe one if you can do it. But yeah, that's, I mean, I've always thought that way and uh, I get it from my father, but one of those kids that always took stuff apart. Sure. And tried to make sure. it, see how it worked and sure. reverse engineer things. But. So talk about your father. You said you got that from your dad. What was yep. it that he did that? Uh, that he's a master that. tool maker. So awesome. he makes uh, anything you could possibly conceive out of metal or wood or anything. So. Very cool. Did you bring us something for a show? Just <coughs> I did not. If, I, if I'd asked <laughs> earlier, you probably would have brought something. But So you um, you were a stockbroker, and then you, you began to make um, some changes down in the city in terms of where you were. Um, knew that you loved that um, that process of, of just kind of massaging things and making them better. And you actually were at uh, another, you actually went to a startup. Mm -hmm. That was a question I had, is like, did you did you make yeah. that startup leap? Uh, well, that's, the consulting firm was a startup, and then I jumped into another uh, small Russian-based uh, currency startup. 
And from there, I uh, moved out of the finance industry into digital okay. for the first time, which was an AOL-backed uh, startup called Patch.com, mm -hmm. which was a network of hyper-local news sites. Uh, and when I got there, we may have had 20, 20 patches across the country. We scaled from about 40 employees to 1,200 and 800 patches in about two years. One of the things that was interesting to me that that uh, about CRM, um, you know, when I when I because I'm I have a research background, I'm a prospect research background, so I'm I'm always you know I'm going to hit it, I'm going to find out what it is, and so I, I was like, okay, so it's it's you know customer relation management, okay, I get it. But as we began to talk and you began to share about how the different sort of things you can do, and you were talking about that company in particular, um, and you say it really casually, like, oh yeah, you know, we had 40 people, and then we it went to some outrageous number in less than a year. But it took some infrastructure to make that happen. Sure. One of the things that you um, you you shared about um, really using CRM ish, and that's my term for the night, CRM ish uh, uh, management things happening is is being able to. You kind of gave an example about talking about continuity and and what would talk about how that happened because uh, it was it was much bigger than you know just it was 40 and then it was ever there were there was there were some things that took place processes yeah i mean it's it's kind of a two way street right you want, i mean you want to protect yourself against data loss meaning people leaving or knowledge loss and you also want to use the same tools to ramp up new people as fast as you possibly can mm -hmm. you know, so a system like uh, like Salesforce or any other CRM allows you to capture you know, all of that pertinent data around mm -hmm. your business, whether it's from the client side or the invoicing side or mm -hmm. product side, whatever that may be, that lives in the same platform. Right. So that, you know, God forbid you get hit by a bust today, somebody that comes in behind you tomorrow is not going to take a year to ramp. Okay. Same concept if it's a new person comes in, we've right. got it all there. They can kind of uh, see it in front of them without having to go to different people to pull it out sure. or, or otherwise. So. so it's really kind of about um, setting up systems and processes, and that's, I know, another you are a systems and process improvement <laughs> guru, I think is how I, um, that's kind of what I got from talking to you. And, and um, talk about the importance of um, continuous system, uh, system and process improvement. Right. Uh, the way that I see it, there's there's kind of three phases of any company. you got the startup mm -hmm. phase and... Uh, more intermediate growth phase and then into kind of a mature phase. And in the startup phase, you may or may not have defined what it is that you actually want to be doing for the most part. It's kind of still working on, uh, working out the kinks and, sure. and, and the ideology there, but when you want to scale, you know, there's there's a few ways to, to tackle that. And the first thing that comes to mind is just throwing bodies at it. So, I mean, the, you're doing a process that takes, you know, X, X number of clicks or X number of days to complete, right. and you want to scale, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, we'll just hire another person. Sure. But, you know, what I do is kind of come in there and I evaluate what that person's doing or what that process is sure. and say, well, there's inefficiency here, this right. takes too long here, this could right. be automated. So you take that and cut it in half so now the same person can do twice as much. Right. You know? And so okay. without having to add, and I, I, I snickered when he said that, I am a very visual person, I'm a visual oral learner, just to let you guys know that. And when when he said, you throw a body at it, I just kind of had this, it's not working. Just throw, some, just <laughs> throw somebody in there. Um, but I get what you're saying, that um, very often that would be the top of the mind response is to, if we just get another person in there, um, that is going to, and, and you know, even as you look at it, that almost doesn't make sense because that's another salary, that's more benefits yeah. and things like that. So if we can come to a place where there are efficiencies being put in place or uh, cutting the clicks, as you say, getting those clicks from 10 to 5. Um, and that is something um, that, again, any any company can do that. It can be a solopreneur. It can be, um, you know, a company that's got two or three or, or four or five people. Um, it can be an enterprise. Um, and, and you've been able to do that. You've worked with some uh, companies. You know, you kind of gave me a range of, you know, small solopreneurs. Um, so talk about that. Is it the, is it the same process for a uh, a single person a business versus an uh, enterprise kind of instill the same type of things? I mean, obviously, the more people you have, the more uh, flexibility you have in the way that you can set up your processes and your, sure. your tech solutions. But, um, you know, and it, it's, uh, 
Give me that question one more time. Yeah, no, just if you if you have uh, a single, if you, you, I think you gave me an example of maybe a landscape or someone that you had helped yeah. build a system yeah. for. And so uh, I also know that you've put systems in place and ramped out, even for Patch or for other companies where it's much larger. And I just wondered if the process, because if it's if it's a similar process, then anyone can do it. It doesn't have to be out of reach for a... Right, right. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I've done stuff for, uh, like, law firms, uh, a dentist office, mm -hmm. um, and it really doesn't matter whether it's the service or you're, you're slinging products of some sure. kind. It's, it all comes down to the data. So right. you've got a system in place that holds your company's data, sure. whatever that may be, mm -hmm. and there are ways to leverage that to automate your business. Right. So it's just a question of defining, you know, what, uh, what you're pushing to the sure. market, how we get it there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of what I'm doing right now is, is thing everything from pitch to payment. So right. uh, everything from what products we're selling, how we're pricing them, how we're uh, delivering those proposals to the clients, how do we book the deals, mm -hmm. how do we track the pipeline for our sales team, how do we then you know, um, push those orders to, to market and deliver what we've actually sold against, <laughs> and then how do we invoice for it, how do we collect payment, how do we show sure. commissions. That whole process right. kind of end-to-end -end lives within that system. What a, there, there's a lot of uh, buzz around the way that Spotify has a lot of focus on the engineering teams, and uh, so you'll you'll see a lot of information about um, the squads and the tribes and the guilds and the. Right. It sounds like World of Warcraft, and I got really excited to tell you it doesn't work like that at all. Um, but uh, I know that that is that's something that that's kind of gotten a, a lot of attention. Um, but it, it almost sounds, even without that, and again, talking about the agile way of, of, of businesses working, but um, it, it sound, almost as sounds as if Spotify has, like your unit I know operates differently, you were sharing, than that. But it almost sounds, even if you look at the company, that there are different units, almost like little mini companies, that are kind of doing their own thing. And so that's that's something that you have in your, in your unit as well. Absolutely. I mean, we... Most of the development teams operate under an agile uh, mindset you know, with their sprints and the stories and stuff like that. Agile. What, what is agile? What are sprints? What are stories? Uh, I mean, agile is a development method that allows you to kind of break apart a big project into smaller components mm -hmm. uh, and deliver against those in, in its succession so that you achieve the whole goal. Okay. As opposed to trying to tackle the entire problem at once, things right. get lost. It just and doesn't work that way. And a sprint? Uh, right, so story is the overall goal that you're trying to solve for, and sprints make up the chunks of the pieces to get you there. I love that. I just, it, it's just, yeah, it, I think that's great. So within within Spotify, those things are happening, and those really are the, the not the mechanics, the specifics of how Spotify does it, but the mindset of having individual units, that can work for any company. Mm -hmm. That really can, um, one of the things we talked about is that is operate, you know, um, I asked you for a, defi a definition of operationalize because that was something we kind of started off with, and um, you you said um, say say what you said. I, I like what you said about uh, what we talked about recently about it's it's about money. Uh, yeah, I mean it's <laughs> if if there's a company out there that has unlimited funds, uh, you know, angel investors that come out of the woodwork for in perpetuity, and we never right. have to worry about paying anyone back or turning a profit. Mm -hmm. By all means, kind of do whatever you want. Sure. But and for those of us that have to appease some people and generate revenue, uh, it comes down to monetization. Right. So, uh, how do you do that? You've got overhead, and then mm -hmm. you've got a way to generate revenue. Mm -hmm. And the key about that is having what it costs to generate the revenue be less than uh, you know what you're paying for your overhead. Okay. So, and operationalizing basically is taking whatever it is that we're delivering, whether it's a product or a service. Mm -hmm. And doing it in, in the most efficient way possible that costs the company the least amount of money and resources right. to do it. So, I mean, if it costs me $10 to sell it and that they're charging nine, it doesn't, it's not really feasible. Sure. I'm losing money constantly. So we need to figure out a way to, to get that $10 for, for nine. Okay. You know, so it, it, it sounds like, again, it, it always comes back to the name of the game is Better, Faster, Stronger. And it's about optimization of whatever that particular... Um, it, it sounds, as we were talking about, um, it doesn't matter if you are a very small, you could be, you could even be in the idea stage. Maybe you're in discovery. Maybe you haven't even formed your company yet. I know we've got some students that are here and uh, folks, we, we, we've got a nice crowd in that we've got um, a real nice uh, variety of people in, in, in various stages. 
uh, of business formation or idea formation. And we kind of talked about the idea of the time to be figuring out about your systems, or at least conceptualizing those, is not when you're already out of the starting gate. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's you can have the greatest idea in the world and, 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 and try to get off the ground running, but if you don't think far enough out to say, well, this is never going to work, you know, I, I can never actually deliver this for a reasonable cost, then it's not, uh, it's not going to work. So, I mean, you kind of need to have the good idea, but also have the plans and the, the operational mindset to say, I can actually deliver this in a way that's not going to lose me money. Right. Have you encountered any companies who didn't do that? Who, uh, that maybe you, <laughs> you weren't going to deform it, but uh, you were going yeah, to fix patch. it? Okay. <laughs> so that was your situation. And, and, so, and, and that was attributable to the fact that there, the planning, do you, do you in, in the different companies um, that you've seen, and also perhaps even in, um, if we're thinking about Spotify, as being as many a bunch of many companies, have you seen that um, that that um, I guess when 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 it goes out first, it's it's kind of not planned. Um, is there is it is it hard to kind of come back from that? Is it kind of hard to uh, you know you hit the you hit the ground? Or I guess let me give you a, a better a better example. Have you seen in companies that you worked at? Where it did, it, it was kind of like a crash and burn, and you said you. you had yeah, that would give that same example. It's uh, our clients. In that case, I was on the advertising side, so mm -hmm. the the clients there are small mom and pop shops, um, maybe buying a couple hundred dollars a month in banner advertising. Mm -hmm. But for us to deliver that, it costs costs us way more than sure. three hundred dollars or whatever it is that they're paying. Um, so the whole concept there, the entire business model, just. Is not is good. not, it's not uh, okay. So so I guess if we're looking at um, looking at some some points for folks to take is that in that idea stage in the planning stage. I think sometimes it's like you got the great idea. Um, one thing I've heard from um, especially uh, folks that are working with students in uh, like startup weekends and things like that. Uh, I'm gonna make the next great app. That is how I'm going. That is my startup. My startup is gonna be an app. It is going to. It's. I'm gonna just like go to the beach. And there's going to be a zillion downloads, and that's it, and it'll be lovely. But that is not at all. <laughs> an app is not a product. Yeah. Or, excuse me, an app is a product, not a company. Sure. So, I mean, companies can produce apps. But right. But in order to kind of deliver on that consistently, that's it's only one product. And there needs to be the systems in place that are, um, we, we kind of talked about the example of, like, you use the company that has unlimited funds. Um, can, can, is still going to experience a bleed? but perhaps not as fast as a company that does not have the resources. Um, and so by, by really taking the care, and, and how, how would you say is a, is a way, in your experience, um, how is a good way to kind of set that up in place? As you, if you're thinking about a business, or even if you have a business that's already established, because you can have a business, and maybe it's not quite going as you might love it uh, to go. Um, and so there's always a, there's that's the thing about continuous system and process improvement. Um, what would you say would be a, a, either a good place to start if you're still thinking about a business or? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me personally, this goes for almost all of my projects. I use uh, flow charts and kind of swim lanes. Okay. Um, What's a swim lane? So if you're looking at a kind of a document, you've got lines drawn across this way, uh -huh. and the process that's snaking its way through it. Each swim lane is a person. Or a role okay. in that. So you got the process start to finish. I sell it to this person. It goes here. This person right. buys it. Right. You know th that way. So I mean, if you can draw it out and a, and a flow chart in your swim lanes and have it be feasible and work for everybody in that piece in that and connect the dots. <laughs> no one's crossing over. And crashing. you don't run into any massive roadblocks. <laughs> then you you got to start there. Okay. But if you can't draw it out in a way that makes sense or can complete the circle, okay, you got to have some work to do. So one of the other things that uh, you and I have in common um, that has really tickled me and, and is, is relevant is that um, part of having part of, of, of being able to you've been um, and you are very humble so you don't like broadcast but you've been very successful in in being able to do that better faster stronger and part of that comes from um, being well rounded and so. Uh, Talk about some of the things, you know, we started at Stockbroker, but before Stockbroker, there was... Uh, I was a bounty hunter. Max the bounty yeah. hunter. Um, <laughs> yeah, Sawyer, bricklayer, worked for my dad for a while. 
So you, so it's it's about building that. It comes to that word that I another. One, I, I looked up so many words with Max polymath, which is like awesome, and I had no idea. I was like, oh, that looks so cool. What does that even mean? And so talk about being a polymath and how that has contributed to um, to your journey. Uh, getting to where you are. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of means uh, jack of all trades. But it in my case, so jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, going back to the, the, the bail enforcement stuff, I mean, the majority, I, I didn't get to do the cool stuff, kicking down the doors or any of that, really, but uh, it's called skip tracing. Right. So basically, you, you have to find somebody. Sure. And my role there is to take the digital footprint, track people, right. and try to track them down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very similar to what I do now, and just backtracking. So you've got a, a process you're looking at or an end result that you want to find, uh -huh. and you have to reverse, keep stepping backwards until you either right. find the problem or find what you're looking for. So, so you, you I, and I, I'm, I'm bouncing around a little bit here, but your role um, uh, is your clients are internal clients, mm -hmm. which doesn't make, I mean, clients are clients uh, and the service, but what was interesting is how you talked about um, that the you know you're kind of you're kind of here and so there's a an issue that comes like we we need you to address this issue and you um you kind of uh, articulate get a clear sense of what that is but then you've got it coming you've got to make sure that things work from both ends so talk about that a little bit yeah so my, my group which is the uh global sales operations group so we're responsible like i said everything from from pitch to payment and it's kind of a, a two-way street. Sometimes there are systems changes that drive a process change, and then a process change that drives a system change. So, sure. for example, you may have uh, your legal team come with a requirement that says you can't do this unless you get this signed. And then in that case, we, that's a process requirement. We go into the system and create rules and and uh, and system validations to control that 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 happens. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there are many other examples where a system change, a new look and feel, new UI, you know, new um, way that we've developed something can right. make the process change. So it's kind of a, a two-way street, and we're we're responsible for the training, also the training, the design, right. and the development. Uh, so going back to what you were saying too about the the agile teams. Yes. The development teams at Spotify are, are strictly agile. They're pretty much writing code all the time. Those mm -hmm. guys are are good at what they do, but. My group is, uh, we have that, but we also have to deal face to face with our entire sales team, marketing, and everyone else. So, you know, the, our development side operates under the agile mindset uh, with their sprints and the stories, but mm -hmm. because we're so client facing and we deal with them every day, we can't necessarily chop training into, sp into sprints or, or things like that. So, sure. it's a hybrid model of, of kind of both. And so, and again, it comes back, and the reason I, I wanted to interject that is it really does speak to your uh, background, that is like my background, where you are a polymath, and you, you have this, um, I like to call it tapestry, this rich tapestry of experience. And so, um, what it brings to, you know, what would you say that, that it, it brings something, uh, a perspective to all of those, um, you know, there was the research that went into being a bounty hunter, and I was a prospect researcher, so that... That's that thing that I'm like, I see a word and I'm like, what is that? Or I, I see a person, I'm like, who is that? And so you, 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 you know, delve right down. And, um, you know, I think when I was younger uh, coming up, it was like, okay, so basically you are like employably schizophrenic, whereas now we're polymaths, you know, where I love that. Um, but it does, I find that it, it does, it provides such a rich uh, place to draw from um, and it gives you that mindset. So the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, Max, um, is in my research on Max, I go to your About Me page, and um, I discover that you are not just, I think you called yourself a technologist, uh, and a musician, um, and a polymath. Mm -hmm. And so I st I, I've, I've heard and read about the connection between music and art, and music uh, and math. And so it, it really made me start to think and wonder, you know, is there a connection? between music, uh, and then as I began to listen to your SoundCloud, and a lot of what you did was imp it was, was improvising. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, you know, is that something that you were able to bring um, the music? Talk about the music. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a blues guy, so playing guitar since I was 10 years old. Um, we, uh, we had the house band at Mario Batali's restaurant in New York for a while. Um, but being a blues guitar player, it's almost exclusively improv. Uh -huh. um, so I, I grew up never 
learning other people's songs other than to play what I wanted over them. Sure. Um, and I kind of take that into what I do now, where it's, it's, I'm constantly improvising. Right. There is no set solution, and there's not even one way to do things half the time. There's 20. Right. So it's just a combination of kind of figuring out what I want the notes to sound like in my head. Right. And then picking the right way to make that happen. Right. So it's very similar. I think um, there was a word that you used uh, that, that really resonated for me was overlay. Uh, and that's kind of what you're doing is you are taking that, that tapestry of experience that you have. And every um, situation that you're coming to, every problem that you're coming to, and let's be honest, we seek it. We do. We seek. <laughs> we're like we're looking for chaos mm -hmm. because we want to make it. You know, we want to make it smoothed out and better because we know that we can. Um, and so it was. It was. It was really. It was. It was very interesting to hear yeah. that when I listened to your music, I was like, I can see that. You know, knowing that you're an improv guy and that you were, um, you're really able to weave that. Um, and I. And I think. Have you. Have you found that over the years, other people that you've worked with that also have the same, I like to call them superpowers, that we have to be able to, uh, you know, kind of um, make things better, faster, stronger. Have you found that, have there, are there other musicians that you found? That there you are a ton at Spotify. And uh, the better musician I've found, the better they are at thinking on the fly and kind yeah. of, uh, of the, the improv stuff. So that is another thing for your hobby list, those of you who are, are wanting to uh, to help open things out and make them. Because it is, it, I mean, it's it's a documented, uh, there's a connection and I, I wasn't sure about it, um, and, I, and I think it, it, it just sounds to me that Spotify just happens to be a music-based industry, but again, these were these were skills that you were able to take. Uh, yeah, I mean, and improvising too is something that takes practice. I mean, it's not just somebody's good at it. It's which sounds of, counterintuitive. It, it but, does, but I mean, it's you have to practice making things up. Yeah, it, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's, it's the difference between um, I have no idea what I'm doing, and I'm just going to throw something at the wall, like spaghetti that's not quite al dente, and maybe it'll stick, and maybe it won't. Or, <laughs> I've got this recipe, this tapestry of, of information, and yeah, I'm going to throw something up there, but it's based on, uh, and that's what I hear you saying, it's really kind of based on this this historical, um, and, and part of that was trial and error, if, it, if you were like me, um, it was like, hey, that did not work, and it didn't feel good, and so we're not going to do that again. Absolutely. But then you, 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 you gain that, um, that sense of, uh, um, Almost like a not being afraid to experiment. Like it's almost like you have to. You have to. Yeah. Well, I, I may not know what works, but I know 350 things that didn't work. <laughs> so that gives me a starting point. It gives you. It gives you a place to start. So that's. So that's very awesome. Um, there were some other things that I wanted to talk to you about. So now we're now we're reaching the note stage here. Um, So one of, the, one of the things that I, and, and we covered this a little bit, was talking about um, companies, and, and this may, it, it may apply, sort of, uh, but rapid experimentation. I think that's something that, um, I know that startups in general, especially startups that have a product, uh, and there's a prototype, and it's, you know, tweaking and making and tweaking and making, but it really, what I'm finding as I'm as I'm doing these interviews, is that it almost doesn't matter if it's a service or it's a product. Um, is that something that you found that rapid rapid experimentation is is useful? I think it's required. I mean, if a lot of times you don't have the luxury of being able to fail slowly, so you know right. it's kind of one of those things where it's better to fail four times and then find the fifth one fast than spend all your money on the first one okay. and and be shot. So. And about testing, um, the testing that you do, it sounds almost as if uh, you put a lot of, because you're putting so much, you know, you're kind of the point person. They come to you and you're the one that has to kind of articulate, <laughs> tell the people what you call yourself as you act as the liaison between, the, because the, the thing that I think is sort of neat but snarky is, like, has anyone else noticed that technology has taken English words and given them different meanings? Is it just me? Because like agile, I'm like, okay, that's flexible. And it, no, it has a completely different meaning. So technology, IT, you IT people have just taken the language. And so that has created a need for Max Weber, who is the... The nerd whisperer. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, yeah, I was like, it's a wrap when you said the nerd whisperer, because I, I got it and it's necessary. You know, so, so <laughs> that really speaks to um, kind of what you do, and and give us a give us a, a nerd whisperer scenario. How does that roll out? 
Just an example. It doesn't have to be. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, especially when you're talking about like a CRM system. Your your sales and marketing guys generally aren't the most uh, tech savvy, and you have to deal with developers on the other end. So you have to take, uh, you know, a salesperson who's telling you, I, I want to click here, I want it to <laughs> pop a button up, and I want it to do this. And then you have to go to a developer and say, okay, well, you have to hit the API from here. You know, use these fields to, to sync with this on this side. And just, it's a different language. If you said right. that to the other guys, they had no idea what I was talking about. Okay. So that is so that is something that you were able to, uh, I, I just, I'm sorry, but I just love that. I, and I'm stealing it. You know I am. I'm going to find some way to, to incorporate that in, into my thing. Um, so, I mean, I mean, it just basically sounds like, um, and I, you know, I wanted to leave some time for folks to ask questions as well. But um, it, it sounds like when we talk about lean, uh, you know, lean startups, that's another, it's a lot of catchphrases that we hear. We hear lean startups and we hear um, about agile, agile businesses, agile um, uh, having to do, I was excited about lean because it, like, it sounded like slender and I was thinking it was like, I don't know, something weight related, but it has nothing to do with that. But having to do with the way um, that a business is running better, faster, stronger. And that you, you know, that the reason that that is, uh, and that combined with the um, CRM, the reason that that's important is really to kind of prevent a crash and burn. Um, I, I uh, spoke with someone once who said that, uh, one of my mentors said, you look at the end. You know, you, you look at, I think sometimes um, as, as business um, starters or business uh, idea folks, we, we, we get a great idea. And we want to just, run, you get that energy and that passion behind it, and you want to just run with it and make something happen. Um, but that it really is about, and, and what I'm hearing you say as well, is you need to have that, you need to take the time to put that end um, really, and I think you talk about moving kind of backwards, um, because it's a lot less expensive time-wise and resource-wise, um, unless you're that you know fictional company that we both want to go to that has the unlimited resources and that you know they just that goes on into uh, into perpetuity, but by really putting that end first um, and establishing a plan with that, that it, it saves some time. Um, what would you say uh, if you were gonna just just make a recommendation or some ideas of ways to thinking? Um, I think sometimes uh, when when the gifting rolls that way, where it's it's about I, I just want to make it better. We don't even think so much about other people don't think like we do. Like I, I, I have a, a kind of a low tolerance for like, why would you even do it that way? Like that is so manual. Like why would you not, um, you know, why wouldn't you, what would you do? What would you, why would you use paper? Like why would you not use Excel and, and let the software, you know, kind of do the work for you? Um, but I think uh, it is, it's, it, it's a learnable trait. You know, like you say that 300 and sometimes, you know, I know that doesn't work because I tried mm -hmm. it that many times. But what would you say to folks if they are saying, you know what? This sounds kind of interesting. I, you know, want to try and incorporate some of this into, you know, I'm realizing even as we talk, it doesn't just have to be about business. It could be just about how we are in the world on a on an everyday kind of basis. And I could be a student, and I may not have a business yet, or I may not even want a business. But what would you say, um, like, if if to try and incorporate some of those things? Um, what are what are some things? Um. Well, whiteboard, I would say. Having a whiteboard is the first thing. To put things visual. To, right. Okay. Swim lanes, your, your flow charts, all that. And especially for, for startups, uh, you're absolutely right. Running lean is kind of the, the most important thing because you need to, the way that I think about it, you have, you have two things going. You have your development timeline, or whatever it is, your product or your service, your rollout dates, launch dates, uh, go-to-market strategy, all of this. Side by side, you have your burn schedule, which is your money, your burn rate, okay. how, how okay. fast you're burning through your money. Okay. And if one, your burn rate is, you know, allows you time to do what you need to do, right, and still have some time left over to, to fix it if it fails or to try again, right, then you're in good shape. But if your money runs out before you sure. finish the project, it's, there's no point in even doing it. And and is it possible to, or I'm sure it is possible, but how how do you kind of Set yourself up so you don't get the, the money burning out before. Um, I think controlling scope has a, a lot to do with it. Okay. Uh, a lot of times when you you start a project, you're like, oh, that's cool. The next day, the next person says, well, this would be even cooler if you add this on, and then you add this, it'd be even cooler. Well, all that just blows up how long it's going to take, the resources required, the testing involved. Right. 
So, uh, you know, I would say control the scope as much as you can because scope equals time and money. Okay. So, you know, if uh, in the initial design you covered what that initial scope was, sure. can it wait for a second version? Right. And you decide that. So okay. Okay. Controlling the, uh, the scope the of the speed project. Of the, the speed of the yeah. project. And, and would you say, um, in terms of adding, like you mentioned, oh, let's add this feature, let's add this feature. So limiting not just how, not how fast you're running, how fast you're burning through those things, but, but would you say add a, add a, add a feature? And, that, and that's a feature, a product, a service, however uh, you're test driving, um, and then test it, you know, furiously before you add the next one? Is that kind of what you're meaning by, by scope? It or? all depends. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, scope is just the breadth of the project. What are sure. you going to include in, in a specific release or a launch? Um, and it all depends what the payoff and drawbacks are. Okay. So if, is this product going to generate more revenue? Okay. So is then... it going to bring in more money somehow? Is it going to gain me more users? Okay. That may offset the, the, you know, the and... change that it, it del delay in time it may take to roll that out. Okay. You know, you have to make that call. Is, okay. is me pushing this out because I'm adding this going to gain me okay. anything that's worth more than the time itself? Okay. So, so really, it sounds like you're saying make things visual in the in the mm -hmm. beginning. Transparency like, is key. Yeah, always. don't get so caught up with the emotion of the excitement of the project or the service or even the idea, but really kind of um, so so thinking really thinking it through and um, getting the advice when you were when you were uh, discovering that you had this love, which you've always had this gift for for improv. You've always had a, a tendency for improv. As you were coming up, did you find that there were mentors or people that you, I know your dad was one, um, but in, in as you were going out business to business, were there um, others that you saw that were doing better, faster, stronger, more so than you, yeah. that you kind of were like, yeah, I can I mean, the, I can uh, the first job that I took after a stock broker at that startup, we built custom CRM solutions for banks and brokerage firms. Uh -huh. And the CEO of that, uh, that company, uh, a guy named Ted, who basically taught me everything I need to know, uh, was... I'd come and I asked him how to do something. He would never tell me. He said, okay. "Figure it out." He'd right. go, "Well, try this." Right. Didn't care how long it took me, but sure. he wanted me to learn. Okay. You know, and, and that's the way that I kind of was crash coursed into into okay. learning that. Like that. Okay. Yeah, and, he, and he said uh, to me, like, "There's nothing sexier for a company than a pimped out CRM system." <laughs> so you know, when you're when you're running a, a tool like that that's running at top speed, you know, producing whatever it can as fast as it can. And your people are using it. Right. You know, it kind of comes down to you could have this the greatest platform in the world. Sure. But if no one uses it properly, you've got nothing to do. Garbage in, garbage out. Right. If nobody's putting data in. I can't get anything out of it. Okay. So. So make it visual. Uh, in the, in the, in your in your starting stages, you want to make it visual, um, whether it's a whiteboard or uh, however it is that you want it to be something that you actually can. You are seeing. It's not just in your head and, and imagination land. But it's something that, like, does that make sense? Like you're saying, when you looked at your whiteboard, you saw that the lanes weren't crashing and the swimmers weren't, like, in other people's lanes. Stay in your own lane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then I hear you saying that mentors are important. Um, so if you can find someone uh, that you can glean from, that's always a good thing. <clears throat> surround yourself with people that are doing it better. Do not surround yourself with people that are doing it worse. That would be Absolutely. bad. That would be dumb. That would lose you time. So surround yourself with people that are doing it better. And, um, and getting the training, is that something that's been a part of uh, your growth, um, kind of what you need to do? Because a lot of it is intuitive. I know a lot of it is intuitive. Um, a lot of it comes from the breadth of experience. But uh, is that that's another piece, it, it, perhaps, depending on what it is that you're doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, me personally, I never went to training classes too much. Or, People hate you for you that. <laughs> it's, I, I learned pretty much everything I know just by failing, by right. trying as yeah. many times as I could and figuring right. out what worked and what right. didn't. Failing to success. Okay. And uh, you know, the, the whole thinking out of the box mentality sure. is, is key when you're talking about operationalizing okay. those, those systems because you know, there's, a, there's a lot involved. Okay, so not being afraid to fail yep. is another one. Okay, so visualizing, uh, getting a mentor, training if necessary. Um, but not being, uh, not really being a, a afraid to fail, and uh, kind of really being ready to, to break that out as long as it takes until you get to that uh, get to that point. So um, I just wanted to uh, leave an opportunity for folks to ask questions. Um, is there anyone that has a? I'm Sean. I'm a student at the University of Rochester. Hi, Sean. I was wondering, uh, what would you do if you have a great idea for a product? And you wanted to ask 
ask somebody for help, but you don't want them to steal your idea. Let me just, uh, kind of, so the question was, if you have a great idea for a product and you want to ask for help, but you're, you're concerned about protecting your idea. Yeah, I mean, if the first thing I'd say, I guess, is to trust who you're talking to. Uh, or have a, a lawyer that uh, can draft you a pretty good NDA. Non-disclosure agreements are pretty simple. They can come from LegalZoom or, or uh, any site like that, and that's legally binding. They can't talk about it. So, if that answers your question. Next. <laughs> <laughs> how does uh, transitioning from Wall Street corporate America to the startup company? How do you make a transition? Very easily. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yes. there's a paycheck that you come back by two zeros, right? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, uh, at, at the start, it was, it was a step back, but I mean, it's just not worth what it was taking away from, from me. You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't like showing up to a suit and tie every single day. I didn't like the way I felt. And uh, you know, to kind of be a part of a, an atmosphere of business that is fast moving, young, uh, is it's just the place that I wanted to be. So it was very easy for me to get out of finance. Okay. Um, a wee bit earlier, I'm Anna from GradCut. Um, I started out in the same way where I really <coughs> played around with a CRM where you say pipe drive. I'm not sure if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. I was just wondering, you know, if you found that, you know, outreaching by email or phone had more successes for you. Um, you know, what was the best solution for you in using the CRM? And maybe if you <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I would suggest Salesforce over any other CRM from the start, just because that's uh, Cause why? that's the one that I found to be you know, the, it's the best thing out there. It can fly a plane Thank if you, you wanted it to. It's, <laughs> there's entire assembly lines that are powered by that platform, right. automated. Um, yeah, so um, picking a CRM too comes down to cost and functionality. So. You know, what what it is that you need to get out of it can kind of de determine what which one you choose. If you're just starting out and you don't really need too much out of it, you can go with a free platform or something that's kind of limited functionality. Um, and as your business grows and scales, you need a platform that can scale with it, which is when you would kind of choose one of those other systems. Uh, in terms of email versus phone, that all comes down to who you're going after. You know, it's a uh, younger crowd. Sometimes you may want to use email because they don't answer the phone. You know, over 60, you might be probably better off getting them on the phone. You know, it depends on, um, on what the product or the service is. I mean, I, and if you're selling stocks, nobody's going to buy stocks through email. So it, it all depends on what the service or the product is to make those calls. Do you really think Salesforce is set up good for a small enterprise though, that's you know, a startup? It can be. Um, I believe they have some free versions that go up to like five users or something like that. But the key to leveraging a platform like that is having somebody that knows how to do it. So I mean, you, you could have access to Salesforce and have the greatest platform available to you, but if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to leverage it, it becomes kind of useless. And at that point, sacrifice some functionality for a little bit more uh, ease of use. You know, but if you've got somebody in house that is uh, has some training in it or has, has used similar systems, it can be much more beneficial because there are more doors that it opens for you. Yeah, I just we talked a little bit about um, using a, a platform like that, not just as it's designed to be used, but I know that you have uh, b built out yourself some other. Um, so that's something. Too, it can be you know designed to use to do things that perhaps it does. It's not designed to do mm -hmm. right out of the box. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I set up my a friend of mine's law practice runs it off of a Salesforce platform. Kind of converted um, all of the, the standard functionality that was there to fit his law practice. You know, like the case files, stores all of his documents there. He's got uh, a form on his website where the client will fill it out. It'll automatically create a lead for him in his CRM system. He gets notified by a text message or email. He'll go in and then um, you know, set some things up on there. He can choose different email drip marketing campaigns that we've set up. Uh, not necessarily marketing, but they're mm -hmm. kind of follow-up automated emails. Um, 
and based upon some of those data points that they choose on his website, he can triage and figure out is this a big, you know, is there some right. money potential here or is the guy want me to fix the parking ticket? Okay, and that's a small so, firm, correct? One guy. He's just a one guy. So that could be applicable if you are able to massage it to do the mm -hmm. things that you wanted to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Salesforce is your thing, but uh, what are some other CRM CR platforms out there that you think not necessarily stacks up for Salesforce, but are just as good or on that level? Uh, I would say Microsoft Dynamics is up there with Siebel. I mean, those three are the major enterprise players in the game, Siebel, Salesforce, and uh, Microsoft Dynamics. If you're a smaller company and can't afford that, I mean, there are a bunch of other options out there. Uh, Act and Goldmine are two that come to mind for me. But, I mean, a lot of times, depending on the level of complexity of your business, you can get away with something like an Asana, which is uh, you know, just kind of a task management tool, things like that. But it all comes down to what you need to get out of it. So if you've got the, the knowledge or the money to get an enterprise level platform, by all means do it. But if you can't, then there's a lot of other solutions out there that can accomplish most of what you could otherwise. Interesting follow up to that. So what are your views on a sales force that sort of does it all versus an Asana and a bunch of other platforms that equals up to sales force in, in, in different uh, things that they do? But they're not only one platform. Yeah, I've run, I've run into that before. I mean, the general argument there is cost. Salesforce will cost more than, than the combined solution of all of those tools. Um, but if cost isn't your only factor, you need to figure about usability. So uh, if I've got 12 things strung together to make what I could have in one, not only do you have to have somebody that manages the connections, but you have to have 12 experts. So it just kind of comes down to which one weighs more? Max, who's your greatest mentor? What's the greatest piece of advice they've given you in the startup world? I'd say Ted, the same guy that, uh, that taught me everything I know about CRM. He said, fail as fast as you possibly can and always use other people's money. Max, do you have any money I can use it? You got some good ideas. Hey. <laughs> Jonathan. Um, Max, cool. My man. Uh, so it's interesting, right? Oh. First of boom. First two markets not always, you know, right and or not scaling right, right, you know, MySpace, Facebook, Pandora, Spotify comes to mind. I'm wondering what it is from your viewpoint out of the CRM operational world that you guys are doing <coughs> that separated you from Pandora. Did he say that word? He said that name. He did. He did. Uh, well, I mean, I actually know uh, a bunch of the guys over there running the CRM Salesforce platform at Pandora, and they do a killer job. So I would say they're on par with what we're doing. But it's, um, you know, it, it kind of comes down to what the business model is, too. I mean, if you've got a, a high volume, low dollar amount business, we're doing a lot of transactions uh, for low dollar amount. It's a little bit more important that you scale that to become efficient, as opposed to somebody who's making half the number of sales but twice the dollar amount. It's kind of like the volume has a lot to do with it. Um, and in our case, and Pandora's case, uh, on the advertising side anyway, it's low volume, high dollar amount. Whereas with Patch, it was low dollar amount, very high volume. Okay. Spotify is, you mentioned Stockholm as the home office or headquarters. Yep. Uh, how global is Spotify and uh, what are the beneficial consequences and benefits of uh, yeah. being global? I mean, we're, I want to say, in 66 countries at this point. Uh, headquarters in Stockholm, second largest office is in New York, but we're in LA, Chicago. Um, I spent some time down in Mexico City, Norway, Latin America. We just launched Brazil. Um, a couple other countries coming, which I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about, so I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I wish that's 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 up there, big market. Um, obviously, being a global company, it allows us to have more uh, of an arena 
to go get dollars from. So, I mean, it's, and it all comes down to each individual country. So, like, take Mexico, for example, they're almost exclusively free users, which is supported heavily by advertising. Whereas, if you take Sweden, 25% of the population of Sweden pays for Spotify, which is yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, being a global company, we can, we can go after a lot of dollars because we have a lot of geography to work with. On the downside, you have to support 13 different languages, you know, 20 different time zones. So it's the logistics of the time differences and the language barriers are hard. Uh, currency, different currencies in all the systems. So it just makes things a lot more complicated to operationalize. But the, the gain you can get from all of that exposure is probably better. Tons. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, especially rights, like digital music rights. The first thing we have to do when we enter a new market is, is uh, work out the digital music rights. So, which that's a huge hindrance to a lot of these things is that we don't get favorable favorable enough terms to make it worth our while to be there. Mm -hmm. So, that answers your question. Uh, uh, based on your experience with startups and living in New York City and uh, you know working with Spotify, how do you see this area that we call Pet Valley? Um, how do you see it growing? Do you see it growing for uh, a space for startups or entrepreneurs? <coughs> Um, do you see it as a space where you know ventures can come and you know we can attract ventures and angels? Do you see this this market growing um, as we call it the Big Tech Valley uh, versus like Silicon Valley? Yeah, versus. I mean I I, uh, I definitely see a lot of potential. Um, I actually had this uh, this conversation the other day where there is uh, a higher concentration of developers and uh, you know tech resources. In the upstate New York area, yeah, it goes, I think, San Francisco, New York, Austin, or, or Denver or something, and then upstate New York is, is right at the top of the list. But they're all subcontracting out, working for people that aren't necessarily based here. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed is, is kind of an attitude that these places have. San Francisco, New York, Boulder, all, all of them are, are celebrating failure. So it's like we get out there, we're going to rapid fire, do all these things. And if it fails, we'll have a party and we'll start again. Yeah. Kind of the, the atti attitude I've seen around here is people are more afraid to kind of put themselves out there to, to take it all away and to, and to be exposed to the possibility of failure. So I think once the attitude comes around to it's okay to fail, let's, let's celebrate this, let's do as much as we can, then it's off to the races. So essentially you're talking about an ecosystem mm -hmm. where everybody kind of supports each other. What do you think it would take to create such an ecosystem that can really, like you said, like a, <coughs> I mean, awareness. I mean, there's a bunch of companies out there, like uh, my friend John over here with Upstate Venture Connect and a couple other things that's, you know, really trying to bring all the players in the game together and share the same visions and attitude. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, there's a weirdo in the back. <laughs> 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 Anyone? Yes. Well, I have the distinct um, opportunity to work with both uh, Pandora and Spotify as the legitimate company um, being an internet media desktop audience. So um, Spotify, I think, um, is the uh, stalker, stalker of the world. They have all the other markets. Pandora is prevalent and strong in the West. So I was watching Spotify come and launch here and try to get into this market. Finally got into this market. What is the market share right now? Well, uh, I would say probably they have 30 or 40 percent more users overall than we do. However, the revenue side is a different story. Mm -hmm. I noticed, um, I don't know if you know Ian Delvis, a uh, guy in Canada, but he was the guy that basically talked to all the, the users, whether it be in parks or internet radios like ours or wherever. They start to put Pandora anywhere. So, and, um, and they were just, they just wanted to proliferate. They wanted to get out there and put it on every device and, and be a part of it. And um, from a German company, we were getting more hits on our website through Pandora, and we were very excited. So they didn't, we didn't have any real promotion on our internet radio. So it was quite interesting to see the kind of um, strength that Pandora had. Um, but Spotify was interesting 
things, you know, distinguished as things that are known as cultural things, thought about as this thing. It was always sort of the, um, people in Europe were like, oh, I wish we could get Pandora, we can't get Pandora in Europe because it's a drug. But Spotify is everywhere else in the world, Pandora has, kind of, it has deep, largest market in the internet and music and this market. So, so I'm curious to watch how me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Anyone else? What's your uh, guitar and amp rig like? Gold top, Gibson Les Paul, and a custom Fender Deluxe. For an amp. Yeah. Nice. Oh, I know. so successful. Anybody else? I just wanted to thank everybody. Thank you, first of all. Thank you. Uh, it's just it's a, just a lot of fun every time you know we have an oppor opportunity to talk. Um, just for taking some time out to come down from Saratoga, I appreciate it. You know, really glad that uh, Spotify is here. Glad that um, we had a chance to connect. Of course, I will continue to bulk and mind meld you for all of the juice that uh, just so many interesting things that I've had a, a you know a chance to learn from you and. Um, continue to learn, uh, which is one of the things I love about Startup Grind. It's really been, um, you know, I hope that folks that come or tune in uh, to the videos are enjoying things. But I, I personally have been so enriched by this process that I'm about to do a LinkedIn blog post that says, Startup Grind made me lose my job because I just quit my job. I quit my full time job. Um, <laughs> Because I just, as I listened to, you know, I've been doing this for nine months now, and as I, you know, I birthed up, I birthed a startup, and I have a startup called The Word Architect, and I'll be helping female entrepreneurs uh, build their brand stories, um, helping them with uh, training for pitches and presentations, building those um, business artifacts. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, uh, ten months ago, I really, you know, entrepreneurship was just kind of a dream and some spastic things that I did from time to time when people would need, you know, some different sort of things uh, come, but um, the gentleman mentioned it being, a, you know, a real ecosystem. And um, so it's exciting to be a part of that. Uh, and just some of the connections and the folks that I have, you know, had an opportunity to meet, you, of course, um, you know, being one of those. And of course, Jonathan, again, is from Upstate Venture Connect, and he came down. I met some folks that really drove a ways to get here tonight, and that's really awesome. Jonathan Agreka is from Upstate Venture Connect, and we got Dave Desalt here who uh, is supporting us, and um, just some new friends that I've, I've made as well. Um, Larry Zimbler, I know, is here uh, from Libertech. So uh, John Sturgis is also uh, comes and supports me, um, uh, supports Startup Grind Albany uh, all the time. Um, and so just really glad that all of you um, took time out of your schedules to come and be with us tonight. Wanted to let you know that our next event is October the 8th. Uh, we have Rick DeRico, who was a reporter for years with Albany Business Review, and he is now the managing director of a new accelerator that is going to be in our area, uh, and it's called New York Biz Lab. And so that will be here on the 8th. We're going to be back here uh, at Over It. And then also in November, uh, we got a reach from Microsoft BizSpark. Uh, so we've got uh, one of their tech evangelists coming down from Connecticut, Joshua Drew, will be here uh, on the 10th of November. Um, and what's going to be neat is we'll do an interview. Um, he also will be, um, and, and for those who may not know, BizSpark for years um, has been marketing towards software developers. Uh, they have a whole suite of services um, that they make available, um, actually give you about 15 grand worth of software kind of to play with for about three years. Realize that there is a... Um, uh, applicability for not just the tech people, folks that are software developers, but also just business owners, uh, because they'll give you a website and some other things. Uh, and if you graduate, graduate, if you go through that three-year period um, successfully, so you build your business, you use their tools to really ramp up your business, there's even a second tier called Microsoft Ventures. Um, so I'm real excited um, that they will be here in November. Josh will be here and um, you know we'll kind of, we'll do the interview and then he'll kind of open up more about what is offered and actually make some codes available for folks. Um, you know, so uh, eligibility um, for that, um, but it's not super strenuous. So um, if you are in that business building stage, or perhaps you have a bill, uh, a business, and are in the market for some things to kind of ramp up, then that would uh, also be uh, a great opportunity to come and, and invite you to come back for that. Um, we do tape 
uh, our events. I've uh, been a little sluggish on getting them up on the website, but we will get those up. So if you're not able to make um, the actual events in person, then make sure uh, we have your email address um, and your name, and we'll put you on the, on, the, on the mailing list and be sure to let you know about upcoming events. And I um, want to thank the Over It team, uh, Paul Hook and uh, Mr. Dinsmore just made it possible for us to, um, they are our venue sponsors. Uh, and so we're real excited um, that they have made this beautiful space available uh, to us. They've done an amazing job in renovating this. You know, Paul said in the beginning they renovated this was a church and they have just repurposed it uh, in an amazingly uh, just fabulous fashion. So um, again, just thank you all for coming. Excited to have you here and, and hope to see you again soon.